We're going to get the workshop started now. Um, thank you all very much for coming. This is the workshop on solitary confinement and political prisoners in the United States. My name is Brett Brody. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and work with the Abolitionist Law Center. Uh, we have a pretty remarkable panel today and I'm very excited so I'm going to uh, get these introductory remarks out of the way and turn it over to our guests. We have with us uh, Clarissa Lopez Ramos, uh, the daughter of Oscar Lopez Rivera, Jihad Abdul Mumit, the national chairperson, co-chairperson of the Jericho Movement, Azabe Zorabi, okay, um, who works with legal services for prisoners with children. I'll give a more full introduction before they speak. And she is one of the attorneys representing California prisoners in the Pelican Bay litigation. Um, so just as way of introduction, systemic and se severe violations of international human rights law are endemic and suppressed features of prison conditions in the United States. Just speak into the mic. Okay. During the last 30 years, the United States has embarked upon a project of race and class-based mass imprisonment unlike anything the world has ever seen. Emerging in this same period has been a regime of super maximum security prison units where people are held in solitary confinement between 22 and 24 hours a day, seven days a week, often for years on end. These units are defined by severe restrictions <coughs> on visitations, phone calls, which are often prohibited, incoming and outgoing mail, limits on in-cell in legal and personal property and prohibitions on cell decorations. Medical neglect, physical and psychological abuse, food deprivation, racism, and other human rights violations flourish in these conditions, which are effectively hidden from public scrutiny. Every year, hundreds of thousands of people cycle in and out of these units in the United States, which are psychologically toxic and emotionally harmful with more than 80,000 people being held in 23 to 24 hour lockdown on any given day in jails, prisons, and immigration detention centers in the United States. Prisoners, their family members, and supporters have long known that political and politicized prisoners are targeted for solitary confinement. Cases like the Angola Three, the California prisoners' hunger strike, and the pretrial torture of Chelsea Manning, and countless other cases provide ample illustration of how governments have deployed torture tactics to control dissent and stifle political agency amongst the prisoner class. In this panel, current and former political prisoners, along with attorneys and activists, will address the importance of fighting against solitary confinement and for political and politicized prisoners in the efforts of the National Lawyers Guild to advance human rights. The discussion will focus on the use of solitary confinement to control and isolate political and politicized prisoners, as well as tactics and strategies for ending the practice. My own interest in this issue dates back to 2007 when I began volunteering with a prison abolitionist organization in Pennsylvania. Among some of the first people that I began visiting around this time were Mumia Abu-Jamal and Russell Maroon Schultz, political prisoners who were then being held at State Correctional Institution Green in southwestern Pennsylvania. Since that time, I've gone on to uh, be a part of the legal team in Russell Maroon Schultz. Um, who is originally from Philadelphia, a political prisoner who spent 42 years inside Pennsylvania prisons. Um, he has currently been in solitary confinement for more than 22 consecutive years and more than 28 of the last 30. And I'm going to say a few words about him a little bit later on in the panel. Um, also, by way of note, I forgot to mention this earlier when announcing our panelists, unfortunately, Dr. Luis Nieves Falcón cannot be with us today. He is having very serious health issues, and so he will not be able to join us. Um, so, with that introduction, I would like to uh, turn the opening comments, uh, or for, turn, turn to our first panelist, Jihad Abdul Mumit. Jihad Abdul Mumit is the co-chairperson for Jericho, an organization that supports domestic political prisoners and prisoners of war and calls for their freedom and amnesty from prison. As a youth, Jihad became involved in the Black Liberation Movement and Vietnam War protests. He joined the Black Panther Party at age 16 and eventually went underground into the ranks of the Black Liberation Army. Jihad was a domestic political prisoner and prisoner of war, serving 23 years of his life in prison for his involvement in the Black Liberation Movement. Jihad? 
And if y'all don't mind, um, I'm going to stand up because I'm going to go through some theatrics here. <laughs> Okay, again, uh, greetings everybody. I hope I don't skew the, um, the, the photographer here. I'm over here. <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, the National Lawyers Guild, the Abolition Prison Movement. Uh, I'm in competition with my friend Brett on coffee, so that's why I got to stand up. I'm, I'm on my fifth cup, he's on the floor. <laughs> but um, I was formerly a member of the Black Liberation Army. I'm one of the, um, I was giving me to say fortunate ones, but it's just the reality that uh, I was able to get out on parole. I came home in 2000, I got off of parole in 2006. Um, I'm so honored to meet uh, Clarissa here, Oscar's daughter, because Oscar is uh, a co-defendant of mine on a case that you're familiar and you're following his cases was the, uh, the big uh, Leavenworth escape uh, debacle. So I was one of the, um, the defendants on that. We were, we were allegedly conspired with a whole bunch of people. Some I'm just meeting here today uh, for the first time years ago we were conspired. So the government is good at that. But I want to take my time to really uh, present an aspect of political incarcerations and political prisoners that I think that uh, we all should be familiar with. But it's really because of the intimidation of the government in today's time, it's kind of like, it's, things are kind of like changing. So if you don't mind, I'm going to take you through a little scenario and build up to a point, which I guess it'll take a good 15 minutes to do it, that's cool. But I would like some noble soul to come up here with me for a second. Do you guys be anybody? I'm not going to ask you to do anything too bizarre. Um, which is that? And if you this, what's your name, brother? Yes, sir. It's Oops. Jesus is going to sit here, kind of like out the way. Like, there you go. Just make yourself home. Because we're not going to pay him a damn bit of attention anymore today. And he's going to symbolize that solitary confinement. That be by yourself. You're not even part of the program, but we're just going to dish you straight out of here. We're going to talk about you a little bit. Judge, we, <clears throat> Jan is signaling to her ear. Okay, you think we okay. I know how to work. Jesus is going to sit behind here to symbolize the isolation of so many political prisoners and so many prisoners in the United States of America. So thank you, brother. Let's pass no mind. So, <clears throat> political prisoners. Jericho is an organization that represents our freedom fighters. Those that's been involved in the movement, the nationalist movements of the 60s and the 70s, a few moving up to the 80s, and we have some, some new, new uh, individuals on our list as the list is growing. And this does not negate the fact that we recognize that there's a lot of political incarcerations, more than we can probably count, many that we don't even know about, and, but we're just one organization. But in, in unity and joining hands, and in lockstep with all the other organizations and individuals and people and, and oh man, brother, and with my other brother here. All of us working together, we can in fact represent, but we're just one organization and it's definitely when it comes to really out reality on the ground, it's about your capacity to do what you do. All right, everybody got that. So the aspect of political prisons that's kind of like dwarfing in front of us, whether or not they receive help or support, oftentimes teeters on the balance of whether or not we may view them as being guilty or innocent. Or did they get set up? Well, I want to let you know straight to your face right now that I'm a freedom fighter. No. And I had a gun in my hand. And we went to work the best we could. And when we read about these struggles in other countries throughout history, we applaud them. When it comes to in this country, I don't know, did the police, you know, whether or not we receive help is predicated on, did he do it? Is he innocent? Did he get set up? And it may be a legal perspective, it may be a safe perspective, but I know in our heyday, you may not have wanted me sitting in your living room. 
truth be told. That's the truth. So do you want the freedom fighters sitting in your living room today? Or do they have to be innocent and just set up and framed by the government? Because we know many of us were. But I'm going to talk about the freedom fighters and why we must support them. The freedom fighters of yesterday that are in jail today and the new ones that will probably come up tomorrow because the struggle continues and it might get very funky sooner than later. So I'm going to talk about the aspect of self-defense and our right to self-determination. We maintain that it's not a discussion or a debate. It's not a discussion or a debate. Whether or not we should pick up a weapon and defend ourselves. Now that's not what's necessarily happening today. Now. But here's the perspective of it, and whether or not it should happen at all. So, you two are together. You're walking across the parking lot in Walgreens. And somebody, somebody comes out and just, here we go. You get ready to get jacked. Yeah, you're, you're walking, you get ready to get jacked. Now, not to be stereotyped that the man protects the woman or the woman protects the man. Somebody's going to protect, somebody's going to protect each other. You got it? If you don't protect each other, and just fear can do a lot of things. But if your decision not to protect each other is because you're afraid at the situation at that given moment, then I say, that's just how it went down. If it happens tomorrow, the same situation, and you show the same type of fear, if you show up chronically, then I can look in your face and I can say, you're a flat out coward. How many cowards we got here? Because I would think that you would protect each other, that you would protect yourself. You don't want to. Who is this guy jumping out after you? Who is this guy robbing you? Who is he? I don't know, but I got to defend myself. You didn't need a book to tell you to defend yourself. Here's the response. I got to defend myself. If it happens over and over again in your communities for decades and maybe centuries, if it is pre-calculated, if it is by design, if it is by policy, then it's just a matter of time before people say, you know what, we have to get a, together a strategy to defend ourselves. Now, if somebody can write about that all they want, well, we shouldn't, well, we shouldn't, this and that, or you will be decimated or you'll be forever oppressed. Our position is we defend ourselves against racist police brutality in our communities. And that's thus the beginning with Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale in Oakland, California in, our, in October of 1966 and establishing the Black Panther Party for self-defense. That's what it's all about. You have a right to defend yourself. You have a right to defend yourself. Biblical scripture, any book you look at, dig up the caveman's bones, the first thing you're looking for around him is what did he defend himself with? What weapon is around his foot? Where is it? Your right to defend yourself. That is your right. That is our right. I represent that even today. Oppressive as the situation is. Because protests, demonstrations, your right to speak out for human rights and justice is becoming criminalized. And a lot of people are rationalizing that in very academic, scholarly books. Why we shouldn't do this and why we shouldn't do that. But the day will come again and you will just remember this occasion here at the National Lawyers Guild where you're going to be confronted with that question about the right to defend yourself. So now let's talk about those who defended our communities, who took that extra step in our communities. Whether or not the National Lawyers Guild or any guild or any attorney or any community organization or any group or any individual should defend them on principle alone. For sure. For sure. So now, when you read a history book and you see a picture of Nat Turner, or you see a picture of Harriet Tubman, Denmark Vesey, Gabriel Prosser, David Walker, all of the notable ones, the Maroons, are they criminals? Are they villains? What side of the line do you view them on? What role did they play and why? Because the why question still exists today. 
And how you answer that question is going to determine whether or not you support our freedom fighters that are in prison today, including Oscar Lopez Rivera. And that's the question. So even as an attorney, even as an attorney, you have to determine how these individuals can be defended. As a community organization, as an activist, that's the word they use now, they, you don't say revolution, I'm an activist. I'm a community activist. I, I activate things in the community. <laughs> Nobody would dare say he's a revolutionary. Nobody would dare say the word socialism. Uh, and, and, or imperialism, they just wipe these words straight out of our vocabulary. It's not even mentioned them anymore. And we're becoming so skewed away from the correct analysis of what's really going on to be able to call a spade a spade. And who wants to get arrested? Who wants the FBI at your door? <laughs> you know, the FBI at your door is different than you being at a protest rally confronting a cop standing there like this in front of them. <laughs> And then there's a little pushing and shoving going on, and then you get cracked on the head and you may get arrested. It's a difference when you get a note on your door saying, special field agent, so-and-so, so-and-so, would like to see you. And your bowels shift. Then you talk to your friends whether or not you should go down there, should you get a lawyer. You think about it. Well, you didn't do anything, what did you go on? And then you maybe go on, and then they ask you about something that you slightly know about, and mention a couple of your friends' names, and you're saying, man. And then they ask you questions that they probably wonder if they already know the answers to, and then that's the other thing. And now three or six months later, here they come again, and now you find yourself indicted with something that's so ridiculous. That's a conspiracy, maybe giving support to somebody, <laughs> or some organization, or something that's so contrived and fabricated, you can't even put hell to it's a tail so with it. And then you, you realize that the lawyer standing there with you is trying to figure out what is really going on now because who understands these, these, these gray terrorist laws in the first place? They make them up as they go, so the attorney's always on, on the curve trying to catch up. They're making it up as they go, and then they have carte de blanche to do pretty much what they want to do. And you realize, man, I might have to take a plea. How much you offering, five years? All right. Well, we did give some money to the Palestinians, and, but I thought that was going for rain, raincoats and boots. And then you find yourself in jail. Well, now, who the hell wants to be in that situation? Who, who wants to be in that? But I remember Huey saying, prison, where is that victory? Where we realize that our situation is no more intimidating, no more foreboding, than a daggone slave running through the thickets with some blood, bloodhounds after him that took the courageous step to run for his freedom. Knowing that they may put a rope around his neck and hang him from a tree, or hang her from a tree, to stand up to that type of oppression then, and you read about it so gloriously in books, then, and you know what, sisters and brothers? That's the type of courage we're going to have to have now. You better dig very daggone deep. So when they come to your door, and this is a BLA member talking to you. When they come to your door, you want to use your hikmah, that's the Arabic word. You want to use your wisdom, right? You want to know what your rights are in your mind. You want to already have it. I know there's a lot of student, attorneys and students here, so you already know that. You want to have your lawyer's phone number program somewhere and have some other things, but your attitude and, and all due respect for everybody in this room toward those that's coming to you, fuck you. Right. <laughs> and if you don't say it like that, then I guess you'll be the one telling in that back room. I swear, you will. If you don't convince yourself to take that type of adamant stand, because I was in prison. With the, with the brothers in the First World Trade Center bombing. And I heard their stories. How can you do something so far on the edge? In 10 minutes in the back room, you're telling your whole daggone history. How does that happen? How does that happen? How do you commit an action and 10 minutes later, you're spilling your guts and giving up all your comrades? How does that happen? 
You tell me. If you don't have what I just said as a core in you, that type of strength, will you recognize them just like I'm saying it now, with that type of emotion and passion? Then they'll beguile you, you'll, they'll, you'll succumb to the pressure, just like governments are. Just like governments are. Just like governments have. To the measly old man, to the measly old FBI agent, to the measly old whoever in the back room, making you spill your guts and tell on everybody and give up the whole movement. While we ride away in prisons, and we diddle daddle with this, we have to have the courage to speak the creativity. We have, each and every one of us have to have that Lynn Stewart spirit, that Bob Boyle spirit, that counselor spirit, to cross the line and tell the judge, Your Honor, I disagree with you. These people are here because of such and such. Everyone in the National Lawyers Guild has to have that spirit. And they, that may be not every case that you take. Because a lot of cases are just maybe street cases and this and that. I understand that. But everybody in this room, since you're at this conference, I know you recognize the politics of what we're dealing with, all the new Muslim cases. To be able to say exactly what it is and have that courage and think creatively out the box because a lot of these cases cannot be just confined to the court room. <laughs> you might have to think since we're here talking, I'm not a lawyer. But you invited me here, and I thank you so much. The invite to other organizations, you have to make the connection with those other organizations, those revolutionary, those community activist organizations. You have to make the connection so that we can help each other. So that we can help each other. So when we say we're bringing these, this is the last point I'm going to make. It's so important to support these brothers, the Russell Schultz. These brothers, 40 years in prison, uh, it's ridiculous. But who's going to be starting today their prison sentence for their political activism 40 years down the road? And be a, some of us will be dead in the room. I'm probably one of them. Just chronologically speaking, if we, we have to be able to find ways to support our heroes, our freedom fighters. That's the point I'm making. And, and it cannot be just confined to guilt or innocence. Somehow or another, lawyers, you're thinkers. You're thinkers. You can critically think and analyze this stuff. It's more than just a guilt and innocence. Is Nelson Mandela guilty of something? You don't even ask that question when it pertains to somebody else in another country. Nelson Mandela, free Nelson Mandela. Guilty as hell. He led the ANC. He went out of the country I don't know how many times to get armed training to wage an armed struggle. It was no issue. You support him. Well, support your little Abdul Muta King. Support the mother brothers, Sunni Adhapu. Support them, Matula Shakur. Don't let them confine us to guilt or innocence and then we're losing that battle. It's more than that. It's the context of we negate and deny our whole struggle when we let them confine it to whether or not somebody was guilty or innocent, whether or not how we support them. It's the context of struggle. These people fighting for our freedoms. It's not just guilty or innocence. It wasn't with Nelson Mandela. It can't be with none of the brothers and sisters that have been there. It wasn't with Eddie, Edwin Cortez, Alberto Rodriguez, Oscar Lopez Rivera. It wasn't. And it can't be. Thank you.
Our next panelist is actually going to be participating via a pre-recorded statement. He can't be with us today because he has been locked down by the state of Pennsylvania for more than 30 years, close to 29 of them spent on death row. I'm talking, of course, about Mumia Abu-Jamal, award-winning journalist, former Black Panther, political prisoner, and uh, published author of several books. So I'm gonna move um, this over to the plug-in over there and play a statement that he has recorded for the National Lawyers Guild Conference.
me, his comments serve as a wonderful bridge between Jihad's impassioned statement and our next speaker, Clarissa, Clarissa Lopez Ramos, um, who is the daughter of Puerto Rican political prisoner Oscar Lopez Rivera, and not surprisingly, his most fervent supporter. An active participant in the campaign for his release, she recently returned from Cuba, where, on her father's behalf, she accepted the El Medi Ben Barca Solidarity Award, handed to her by freed member of the Cuban Five, Rene Gonzalez. Clarissa? I'm going to try my best. Um, my first language is Spanish, which is el idioma que domino. But I'm going to try my best to um, speak in English. Um, I'm a mother, well, I'm an only child, and it's kind of difficult not to be your, not to work for the freedom of your of your dad, if more especially if you're only one child. Sometimes I ask my dad if, if I have another, but if I have a brother and sister, but he can, he always say no. <laughs> um, for the past 32 years, my dad has been in prison. I'm 42 years old. The first time I met him was at the Metropolitan Correctional Center in Chicago. I was 10 years old. So imagine um, the relationship that we have developed through the years has been in prison for 12 of those 32 years, my dad was in control units, first in Marion, and after that, they built the ADX in Florence, Colorado, and of course, my dad was one of the first person inmates that was transferred to Florence. I was, uh, like I said, I was only 10 years old. I think I was probably 12 or 13 years old when I first visited my dad in Marion, and if I close, close my eyes, I can still see the place. It smelled really bad. Um, people were really, really, um, it was kind of loud. And it was a really ugly place. My dad, they used to bring him, my dad is a short person, and he's like five three, five foot three inches tall. And he's really skinny. So I used, always I knew when they were, bringing my dad to the visiting room because there was like four or six guards and there was an empty space in the middle and that empty space in the middle was my dad and um, it, it wasn't empty but you know you can see so for the for quite a years we were having visitors in Marion Marion was um, when he, he used to describe his cell it was six by nine Everything was in one, the same color, including his clothes. He didn't have any contact with, um, with contact basic with us, and the with the inmates, um, it was mostly none because um, he was 23 and a half hours black in his um, cell. So imagine um, how we used to have visits through the glass. It was like. Um, little cubiculo, I don't know how to describe it. And he was in front of me, a glass, a proof, bulletproof glass, and there was a phone, two phones, and two shares. And I started visiting him when I was 13. So he, we don't have pictures or together, because um, they were not allowed. He saw me, he saw my, he saw me growing up, like, from child to uh, my uh, adolescence, and then I became a, mo a mother of Karina, his only granddaughter. And everything was like through the glass. When I became a mother, it was harder. The visits were harder, because um, like I said, he met me when I was 10 years old. So practically, he missed 10 years of my life. And he was trying to see in Karina, although things that he couldn't be, he couldn't saw uh, when I was growing up. And it was harder for Karina, you know, as small children in that place, trying to be quiet and because we didn't want the guards to be like on top of us. So they started developing a uh, language in a plane, a little game. And they used to put their hands in front of the glass, the bulletproof glass, 
Karina will do it from one side and my dad will do it from the other side. And then we start playing for three, five, four hours out of the visit and they were playing and that happened, you know, that that um, they did that until Karina was seven years old. Um, in 1998, my dad was transferred to Terre Haute, where he current where he is right now, and that was the first time Karina was able to see him uh, without the glass. And I remember that when we went to see him, um, he came to the visiting room, and when Karina stand up in front of him, she automatically she put her hands in front of him. And she didn't want to touch him because she was scared. Because for the f first seven years of her life, she was not able to touch her grandfather. So the only thing that she knew how to do was putting her hands in front of the glass. So imagine, look, you know, when when you have a, a child and then you become a grandfather, like he does, he did. It's harder because now you have two people that you have to look for, and. My relationship became a lot, a lot better when I became a mother. That's how you can understand how much, um, how much you can do for your family and how much you can do for your, um, for your daughter or son. And I know that the hardest thing is not to lose your freedom. It's just not to be there when, when you have a son or daughter or when you have your family. When sometimes people ask, um, how can lawyers can help? And here in this room, there's, there's Evan Cortez, one of the Puerto Rican political prisoners that was released in 1999. <laughs> that release was the result a lot of work, not only from one of the most amazing lawyers that I have met, um, Jen Sosler. Yeah. But um, it's, it's a collective job. You have, it's not only the attorney, the attorney and the committees to help, you know, in the case of uh, Puerto Rican political prisoners, the Comité de Derechos Humanos, the Human Rights Committee here in Puerto Rico. And now that in this, um, so a lot of people, this is the first time that they heard about, um, about my dad. And I hope you can um, spread the word. <coughs> 32 years is a long time. We want him back home. And you know, um, as as I see Edwin, that's the same same way I want to see my dad sitting in a room, um, having a cup of coffee, um, walking by himself. He's a seventy years old grandfather already, and you know, I think thirty two years is way too long. So, um, at the, when you visit this room. There's a white sheet, a big white sheet in the right hand side that you can sign. We were going to use that for November 23rd. We have a march for the freedom of Oscar. It's called Caminata por la Escarcelación. And it will be um, one of the ways that you can help us. Leaving your message in this sheet is all, all the way in the exit. Um, That's all I have for my Thank you so much, Clarissa. Our next panelist, Azade, is a current Soros Justice Fellow at Legal Services for Prisoners with Children. She is on the legal team representing Pelican Bay prisoners in their class action lawsuit challenging long-term solitary confinement in California and on the prisoners mediation team for the California prisoner hunger strike. 
Zarabi is a graduate of the University of California's Hastings College of Law, where she was the editor-in-chief of Hastings Race and Poverty Law Journal. During law school, she interned at the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights, Justice Now, and the San Francisco Human Rights Commission. She is the author of two academic articles, Resistance and Repression, The Black Guerrilla Family in Context, and Creating the Bad Mother, How the U.S. Approach to Pregnancy in Prisons Violates uh, the Right to Be a Mother. Zorabi is magna cum laude graduate of University of California, River Riverside. Azadeh? Thank you. It's an honor to be here among all of you and among all of you. Um, I have the privilege of working with people who are uh, isolated in the security housing units in California state prisons, uh, which have really been a stronghold of the prisoners' rights movement since at least the 1960s. And we've had a, a few well-known political prisoners come out of California, including uh, Geronimo Pratt, rest in peace, and Romaine Chip Fitzgerald, who's been in, uh, in prison since 1969. But most of the prisoners whose names are well-known and associated with the prison movement in California are not people who are there because of their political crimes. They're people who were politicized once they were in prison. Um, and many of them were politicized once they were in prison because they were not on the streets as young people. A lot of them entered the uh, criminal justice system as youth, as young as 14, 15, 16 years old, and were raised within the prison system and became politicized by other prisoners while they were there. Um, these people include people like George Jackson, Hugo Pinnell, Rochelle McGee, and the leaders that we see emerging now um, in this re-emerging prisoner rights movement in California. Um, and before I continue, I'd like to just bring some of their names into this space because really they should be here telling their stories themselves. They are the experts of their experience and are more than qualified to speak to us, but um, we're not even able to, as lawyers, we're not even able to record their voices clearly because we can't. Just like the visits you described, it's behind glass, it's for an hour, we don't even have access to our clients to be able to bring their voices to you, and some of our lawyers have been banned for trying to record their voices and bring them to you. Um, so I, because they're not able to be here, I'd like to at least evoke their presence by saying some of their names. Heshima Denham, Zahara Budoro, Sitawa Nantam Bujama, Mutope Duguma, Todd Ashker, Randall Ellis, Gabriel Reyes, Akili Castellan, Danny Troxel, Paul Red, Antonio Guillen, Gabriel Huerta, and Abdul Olubala Shakur, just to name a few. And on behalf of them and all of our colleagues and comrades in solitary confinement in California, I'd like to express profound gratitude, solidarity, and love to the National Lawyers Guild for all the work that you've been doing in support of all prisoners internationally. So I suppose most people know a little bit about what's ha been happening in California because we've been in the news a lot lately. Over the past two years, um, the men that I've named and many others that I did not name have launched three massive hunger strikes in protest of long-term solitary confinement and the criminalization of um, radical politics in prison. Um, the first hunger strike happened in 2011. Actually, let me back up. The first hunger strike happened in 2002. Um, and didn't get as much media coverage, but was ended when legislators vowed to get involved and to do something. Ten years later, in 2011, nothing had changed. Many of the people who were in solitary confinement back then were still in the same place, and they launched another hunger strike. The first hunger strike was joined by over 6,000 people and lasted three weeks. It was called off when the Department of Corrections promised to make some changes. Three weeks later, they, the prisoners felt like the Department of Corrections was not three weeks later. It ended in July, and the next hunger strike started in September of that same year. They felt like the Department of Corrections wasn't even making a good faith effort to address any of their concerns, so they launched another hunger strike. The second one was joined by over 12,000 prisoners and also lasted three weeks and was called off when, again, they were promised changes. Fast forward to 2013. Fast forward to 2013 and we're still in the same place. Uh, in January of 2013, they sent out an announcement uh, to the legislators, to the governor, to the Department of Corrections, saying that if you don't 
make progress on the demands that you already promised that you were going to make progress on, we're going on hunger strike again. So on July 8th, 30,000 prisoners joined in a hunger strike. 30,000 people. That's 20% of California's prison population. Obviously, many of them were not in solitary confinement and just joined in solidarity. There were also work stoppages that happened. Um, and a lot of what is, what is happening in California prisons is um, based on a process of uh, gang validation. This is how people end up in long-term solitary confinement for indefinite terms. So in California, we have people that have been in solitary confinement for over 40 years. Pelican Bay opened in 1989, and there are still people in Pelican Bay that were there when it first opened in windowless cells, um, very little access to even be outside. When they're able to go outside, it's in another like bigger concrete cell, basically. They get 90 minutes a day in there. Uh, they don't get to interact with other prisoners. The visits are exactly how you described. Um, at Corcoran State Prison, they're only an hour long. At Pelican Bay, which family members often have to drive 14 to 16 hours to get to, they're only 90 minutes long. They don't ever get to touch their family members. They don't have any human interaction besides with prison guards and medical staff that they don't even feel um, act in their best interest. Um, so why are they being isolated? If you, let, if you let the state tell it, it's because these men are dangerous gang leaders. But upon closer examination, we can see that this gang label, much like the terrorist label, is being misapplied to criminalize radical politics and independent critical thinking. <coughs> and actually during the hunger strike, when our mediation team was meeting with the Department of Corrections to try to negotiate the end of it, the Department of Corrections specifically said, we will not negotiate with terrorists. These are people, <laughs> um, who engaged in a nonviolent, peaceful protest, and their only act of resistance was, resist was refusing food, res refusing trays. <laughs> so we see the Department of Corrections completely being opposed to any kind of progressive um, movement on any of these issues or any kind of collaborative effort to try to change the situation. This procedure that, that um, they use to put people in solitary confinement is called gang validation. And basically what it is, is the gang investigators at the prison have to come up with certain evidence that they say links these people to a gang. So for black or new African prison prisoners, it's if you have anything related to George Jackson, Black August, Black Panthers, Malcolm X, anything with a dragon on it, anything written in Swahili is all seen as gang related material. Um, and for Latino prisoners, it's often Aztec or Mayan artwork or even writing in Spanish. I got a call from an 80-year-old woman who wrote her, her grandson at Pelican Bay and referred to an article in a Spanish uh, newspaper called El Sol. And the letter was returned to her with a note from the gang investigator saying that she could no longer write her grandson because um, her use of that word was gang communications. So these are a lot of the ways that family members are disconnected from their relatives that are in, in solitary confinement, um, even beyond the isolation that already exists because of their confinement, are further isolated by being banned from visiting, being terrified by, they're, they're getting calls and, calls and harassed by the gang investigators. These are like older law-abiding citizens that don't have normal contact with the police and are now terrified to even um, communicate with their loved ones. Fortunately, since 2011, we've seen a lot of family members begin to resist as well and begin to organize themselves and other family members and have really become um, a driving force in the movement to end long-term solitary confinement. Another kind of evidence that they use um, is confidential informants. And this goes to what Brother Jihad was talking about. One of the ways that you can get out of solitary confinement is through a process called debriefing. There's basically three ways you can get out of solitary confinement. Parole, which means you have a set date to get out, you die and you're carried out that way, or you debrief, which is a fancy word for snitching, and you have to tell everything you know about the alleged gang that you belong to. And if you aren't actually a member of the gang and you're there because of your political ideology or because of the artwork you possessed, there's no way you can debrief because you haven't been briefed in the first place. So some people do get very desperate and make up stories and gang investigators use this as information 
that brings other prisoners into solitary confinement, and they're never able to see who made these statements against them. They're not really even able to see what the statements are. It's basically just, this person said you're a member of this gang, therefore you're a member of this gang, and you're in solitary confinement. Many of the prisoners, most of them, absolutely refuse to even think about the debriefing process, and they see this as um, something that they will not engage in even if they have to die in solitary confinement. So in response to this, and in response to the many, many years that many of them have spent in isolation, they organize themselves and risk their lives in these hunger strikes to bring about meaningful changes, not just for themselves, but for everyone who's currently in prison and everyone who may come after them. Many of them will tell you straight up, I don't think I'm ever getting out of here, but if what I'm doing now can prevent somebody else from coming here in the future, then it's absolutely worth it. And they've succeeded in doing that. Um, 30,000 prisoners went on hunger strike. Many of them lasted for 60 days. After 60 days is when it was finally called off. Just for context, Bobby Sands died after 66 days on hunger strike. And many of these men are older. Um, many of them already had very serious chronic health conditions that were um, exacerbated by their participation in this hunger strike. Um, but the protest was very successful in bringing international um, and mainstream media coverage to this. And there was even a big difference in between how the media discussed it in 2011 versus 2013. For example, in California, they won't even admit that they're using solitary confinement. They just call it segregation. Um, they say that because the prisoners can have TVs in their cells if they can afford them, then that's not solitary confinement. <laughs> But in 2013, we saw the media using our terminology and actually calling it solitary confinement and actually calling it torture. So that was a victory. They've also succeeded in having um, Amnesty International come investigate the prisons and do a report. Juan Mendes, uh, the U UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, was just in California speaking on this issue a couple weeks ago and has, has asked the US State Department for permission to come examine US prisons. Um, and they've succeeded in other things. They've um, initiated a strong legal challenge against solitary confinement and earlier I referred to them as our colleagues and this is absolutely true because of the role that they play in this. Um, they were the ones who filed the lawsuit that, uh, that we're currently litigating. It was them that did it first and the lawyers came along later um, and, and joined on as counsel and amended the complaint. They were the ones who initiated the communications with the legislators about what laws needed to be changed. Um, they came to an agreement among themselves to end the decades of racial and geographic hostilities that they had amongst themselves, much of which was uh, initiated by prison guards, and um, there's actually been prison guards that have been charged and tried for this, but it's still very much um, happening, it's very much prevalent in, in all the California prisons. Um, and they organized themselves and prisoners across the, straight, across the state to engage in a massive, nonviolent, peaceful protest for human rights. Um, and they did this from what they call their concrete tombs in the most remote prison in California. Um, so it would be a mistake to just call them clients. This is really a collaborative effort with these people. Um, and there's three main avenues that we're now pursuing. One is the prisoners' own direct actions, the hunger strikes, um, the work stoppages, their communications with the prison department themselves. And just to clarify, the prison hunger strike was suspended. It was not ended. So there is a possibility that it, they might resume it. We're hoping it doesn't come to that, but that possibility is there. The second avenue is the litigation, which is a federal class action lawsuit challenging solitary confinement. And the two main claims are uh, an Eighth Amendment claim and then a due process claim. And then now there's the legislative angle. The hunger strike, uh, the most recent hunger strike only ended after 60 days because two of our legislators in California, Senator uh, Ronnie Hancock and Assemblyman Tom Amiano, promised the prisoners that they would have a series of legislative hearings and look into presenting legislation to address uh, long-term solitary confinement. Um, and that's what made them come off their hunger strike. And we had the first of the hearings um, on October 9th, and um, in our opinion, it went really well. Since then, we've had family members ha have face-to-face -face meetings with uh, Senator Hancock, um, and they're both, both of them are doing a lot of research about what's going on and what are the best ways to address this. They've been looking at what's happening in other states and how other states have reduced their solitary confinement, um, the number of people in solitary confinement. 
So right now we have a really important opportunity to actually create changes, not only in California, but there's a national discourse about the use of solitary confinement and how it's torture and how we need to end it. Um, and I encourage us to think of this not just in terms of prisoners who are political prisoners or prisoners who are politicized, but everyone. Uh, solitary confinement should be abolished and before we abolish it, it should at least be a, a last ditch resort, not something that we resort to um, for any any problem that we have. Right now it's used to for, for transgender prisoners if they're um, it, with the idea that they may feel unsafe. It's used for prisoners with mental health conditions. It's used for anyone that's seen as a problem, maybe because they're jailhouse lawyers, maybe because they're too effective in general population and get, in terms of getting other prisoners to um, realize their self-worth and come into knowledge of self. So we need to abolish solitary confinement. Because there's so much momentum around this right, right now, there's a lot of ways that people can get involved. If you're in California, I strongly encourage you to connect with our coalition. We have very strong groups in Northern California and Southern California that are doing very important work. But if you're not in California, there's still another very important way that you can help. I mentioned that prisoners were on hunger strike for 60 days, and a lot of these are older prisoners that already have very complicated health issues. So there's been a lot of damage done to their internal organs, and some of it we don't even know about because they're not able to get adequate medical treatment or get the tests done. We've heard of like people with their hearts skipping. Some people have had um, you know intense pain. Some people have had um, lightheaded and dizziness and keep falling out and hitting their heads or breaking their bones because they're falling out in their concrete cells. Um, and there's been a lot of retaliation against a lot of these people for participating in the hunger strike. Um, and now that the hunger strike's over and there's not all this immediate and urgent attention to the prison 